talk about what a world without passwords will look like. And I hope that you can all hear me. Thank you. Um, all right. When you think of the future five to 10 years from now, you might probably be thinking of um, flying cars, teleportation, which is my favorite um, as a frequent traveler. So we'll no longer have to get into airplanes and every airport will just have their own teleportation portals. You get into it and you're transported to the portal at the city you're going to. Um, or maybe you think of like Jean, um, sorry. Or maybe you think of gene editing, but in thinking about the future, what about thinking of a world where passwords were no longer a thing? Like you no longer have to um, remember multiple passwords for a, all the um, 1001 accounts that you have, and you don't have to frequently be intimate with the reset password key on button on um, several online accounts. And as software engineers, that future is possible right now, and we can bring them to um, make them reality and mainstream if we want. And this is what this talk is about. But before I move on, I'll just quickly introduce myself. Um, my name is Linda Ikejuko, and the most important fact about me is that I hate passwords. Um, they are like the bane of my existence. I'm a software engineer, and I'm currently a developer advocate for a company called Small Step Labs. And um, we build open source tools and a platform that helps teams and organizations prevent unauthorized access using um, device identity authentication. So in this case, the device becomes the access, and anyone without a company-approved um, device cannot access sensitive resources. Um, when I'm not under the siege of capitalism, I'm playing tennis, pretending I'm Serena, or learning to play the guitar, or just um, eating from all over the world. Uh, so here's what we're going to cover today quickly in the next 30 minutes. Um, why password sucks for your users and you, pass keys what they are, how they work, and why they're better than passwords. And then we'll look at how to implement pass keys in the real world, and we'll just round that up. Um, a fun fact is that pass keys were actually an um, accidental happenstance because um, the early computer network um, inventors and creators, which were people in the academic and research circles in MIT, just came up with passwords to um, create a personal point of entry for consoles within their research facilities so that each user could have um, segment their files. And then somehow these passwords have persisted up until now, because when they did that, they didn't have any um, put any real-world considerations to that um, implementation. And we've stuck with that for a couple of years now. The problem with passwords is that for your users, they are a headache. And the average person has roughly 50 online accounts, right? And for each of these accounts, we're asking people to come up with something that is seemingly random and unique and at the same time difficult for computers to guess. Now, at this point, you're thinking, well, um, password managers. Well, how many of your end users use password managers? Yeah. And I'm not sure why their image is not showing. Probably the Wi-Fi which has become worrisome to me. But that image there, so I don't waste more time, is literally is, um, a password book. You know, some users have gotten so tired and frustrated that they've become very innovative and created dedicated 
password book as a product. And these are actually sellable on Amazon, like they're actual devices with hundreds of reviews on Amazon and people buy them because they're frustrated with passwords and now they have books, notebooks where they, you know, store all their passwords. And it's quite funny because like, um, one of the first things you're told in corporate trainings is never to write your passwords down. And, but you can't blame them because like remembering all these passwords is a chore and soon enough, people just fall into insecure behaviors. You know, the cycle of having to constantly come up with something complex, forget it, click, click, forgot password, reset and repeat. And then, you know, when we eventually come up with something seemingly um, secure, maybe we pick something that is easy to remember, like our pet's name, or your child or partner's name, capitalize some letters, add some random keys somewhere, and you've struck gold. And the average user will just end up using that password across all their major accounts, you know? And um, when that happens, what happens is that when there is a password breach on one file, because your users have reused the account, the passwords that they use on your application on other accounts, um, those other accounts are susceptible to breaches too. Every day we hear of data breaches, Okta was breached, Luba was breached, and year in, year out, the um, fundamental factor behind these breaches has remained uh, credentials, stolen credentials. In the 2024 Verizon data breach investigation reports where they analyzed over 10,000 data breaches, um, they still found like all previous years that credentials were still the leading cause of data breaches. So like I was saying, I mentioned that passwords just create um, very frustrating user experiences for users. And apart from the terrible experiences, um, the biggest problems or that passwords present is that they can be phished. And phishing occurs when someone attempts to steal sensitive info by presenting as a legitimate entity. And um, the pictures on this screen are from a movie called um, The Beekeeper. I don't know if anyone has seen it, but yeah. It's quite good. Um, so in the movie, a widow receives a fake pop-up on her computer that she has a virus on her device and needs to call an antivirus company to fix the issue. Um, she calls this number and is connected to a man who leads a cyber scam company. And then he tells her to download a certain software which would help him um, fix the issue remotely and tells her that he's going to compensate her with $500 for the inconvenience. Um, in doing that, he accidentally deposits $50,000 instead into her account and tells the woman that he would lose his job if she doesn't send back the money. Like, um, and so uh, the woman logs into her account in trying to send back the money and once she logs into her account, her account was wiped, and in grief, she kills herself. So that's the summary of that movie. But let's unpack what happened in that movie in just a few minutes. And what happened was a keylogger attack. Um, maybe she visited a compromised website with some malicious ads and somehow got persistent malware on her device. And then when she calls the number and the man on the other end convinces her to download the software to help with remotely fixing the issue she had. Unknown to her, she had just downloaded a keylogger, a remote access software, and when she enters her um, bank details to transfer the SS funds, the attackers were able to harvest the password. And this scenario here is 
one aspect of social engineering, um, which is fundamentally the problem with password authentication. And that's not the only way that phishing can happen. Um, you might be quite um, familiar with email phishing attacks. Um, sometimes you just get these strange emails from um, email addresses that look like the real deal, but then they are not. Um, and people do fall for that, actually. So messages are sent using domains that look like legitimate bodies, but are not. And now you might be thinking, oh, it won't happen to me. But the deal is that these types of tricks um, take advantage of emotions, which are, are weaknesses and are strengths too. So, and that's why I'm not here to talk about how to avoid falling for this type of tricks because it will happen. It just takes one person to fall victim to it and they get into your system. Um, and the deal is that because of the way phishing works, even OTPs do not um, protect you because in the instance of um, the movie scene we just talked about, the widow, when you enter your password and enter an OTP, which is supposed to be an added layer of authentication, the key logger will still get it. And the person on the other end will just use the OTP immediately too and just get in. So OTPs can be fished too. And that's merely because they have to be transported from client to server to prove identity. Now, um, what if we didn't have to deal with all this? And that's where um, pass keys come in. Pass keys are a um, digital credentials um, comprising of a public key and private key tied to a particular user account and provide a way to securely sign into apps and websites without needing to remember a password or a username. With pass keys, devices become the um, access portal where you prove that you own a device and the device prompts you to unlock um, the device. And by doing that, you're signed into the account that you want to sign into. So let me just quickly explain how that works. Um, pass keys are based on the workings of public key cryptography, where there is a public key and there is a private key. And data encrypted with the um, private key can only be decrypted with the public key. And they are mathematically linked to each other. Um, public keys solve the problem of how do I securely verify my identity to a party without directly sharing sensitive authentication credentials with that party. And remember that that's the core problem of passwords. So um, here's what happens in public key authentication. You create an account with the server, and then when the client wants to sign in, the server sends a challenge to the client and the client signs this challenge. And by signing this challenge, what happens is that it runs that challenge, which is usually a random, a really long random um, string through a hashing algorithm to produce a hash digest. And this hash digest is then encrypted with the private keys of the client to produce a signature. It sends that signature to the server and the server decrypts the signature using the public key of the client, remembering that um, the public key is public, anyone can get it, but whatever is encrypted with the public key can only be decrypted with, whatever is encrypted with the private key can only be decrypted with the public key. And so when it compares these hashes, if they match, then access is granted. 
Um, this is very fundamental to how pass keys work. And if you understand it, then you've just understood how pass keys work. In implementing pass key authentication, there are three parties involved. You have the relying party, which is typically the web server or the application that needs to verify a user's identity. And you have the client, which is the device which the user will interact with during the authentication process, like a laptop or a smartphone. And then you have the authenticator. And the authenticator is the hardware or software component that stores the private and uh, private key, also creates the private and public key, and securely stores the private key in a way that it cannot be extracted from that device. In Apple devices, you have your um, secure en enclaves. And um, the authenticator can either be a platform authenticator, which would be um, built into your phone, like I just talked about Apple devices where you have the secure enclave, or um, an external key like a UB key or any other security key. Um, let's just quickly look at how pass keys pass. Um, a user registration flow. So um, first, a, when a user tries to register an account with a website that has passkey authentication enabled, it will send a signal or opt to um, register a new account to the relying party. And the relying party will send over a challenge, which we talked about and a username which the user would have provided and information about itself to the client. The client sends this challenge to the authenticator, which now creates a private key and a public key and uses the um, private key to create a signature from the challenge, like I previously explained, and um, sends it back to the client, which then routes it back to the web server, which will now check, verify the signature, and grant access. Sorry, I'm moving too fast, but I've wasted much time. Um, so let me just quickly demo what passkeys look like in the real world. So I'm going to try registering a new account on this Pass key enabled website just to show what I've been talking about. Um, so when I try to create a pass key, I'll be asked to authenticate that I am the um, owner of this device with a biometrics, which is what I'm doing now, iTouch, and my pass key for this account is created. I'm going to sign out and try to sign in. Why does this keep coming up? You know. So gosh. Okay, now when I try to sign in, um pass keys are discoverable and they are tied to a specific domain, 
And so when my browser notices the domain I'm on and checks with the authenticator that it has a corresponding pass key, it um, brings that up and I can select to sign in with it. I'm gonna click this. And again, before proceeding to do anything, I'll be asked to verify that I own this device. And when I do that with a biometric, I am signed in. Okay. So what happened when I tried to sign in was that, first of all, my client sent a request to the server for me to sign in, and the server sends a challenge to my client, which it forwards to the um, authenticator. Now, before my authenticator signs that challenge and sends it off to the relying party, I am prompted to um, verify that this request is coming from the legitimate owner of the device, which is why I have to use a biometric or whatever system I use to lock my device um, on another device. It could be a pin or a pattern. Okay, so from all we've talked about, how are pass keys better than passwords? If we consider the movie scenario we just talked about, where um, where the widow downloaded um, a software, a key logger, unknowingly, if her um, bank account was pro protected with pass keys, what would happen is that that attack wouldn't work because um, there are no typing of sensitive credentials involved and the sensitive credential, which is the private key, never actually leaves the device. It just signs the challenge and sends the challenge back. Um, the private key, which is the sensitive credential here, the secret, does not leave the device and so the attack would not have worked. And I need to stress that when you use your fingerprint to um, unlock your device, when you use it to pass keys, your biometrics data is never sent out of your device to, it just verifies with your authenticator that you are the legitimate owner of the device. What's sent is the signed challenge. That's the only thing that is sent back to the web server for verification. And um, in the case of email phishing, um, since pass keys are tied to um, a domain, when you register a pass key, the relying party sends information about itself back to the authenticator and the authenticator stores pass keys alongside the info of the domain name it um, originates from or the domain name that pass key belongs to. So what happens is that for um, email phishing where you click on a fake um, link, that wouldn't work either because um, your authenticator wouldn't be able to provide sign-in credentials for that particular fake account. Now, um, additionally, pass keys provide better US for your users because it's faster. They just need to um, unlock their device and they don't need to remember anything. And then for you, you no longer have to deal with databases of sorting and hashing and all that. Um, talking about using pass keys in practice, um, I did a poll on Twitter and most of the info I got, um, the average end user is basically tired of passwords and they would usually appreciate if your app has pass keys as a sign-in um, option. And it's not just for um, end users, even for internal web apps within your organizations, when you implement pass keys, you're literally stopping data breaches in their tracks because what happens is that um, for devices that are approved and your um, employees or team members register pass kits on them, they will not be able to log into 
that account from any other device when you disable um, pass key syncing. And so access is now tied to that approved company device, which means that the um, attack vector of data breaches is reduced. If you need another reason to implement pass keys, um, it's because you're in good company. A lot of um, organizations and apps are starting to implement pass keys, TikTok, um, Dashlane, Kayak, and there are a lot of them. Okay, I'm just going to breeze through this path. Now, the API that powers pass keys are called um, under, uh, under an umbrella called Web Auten, and Currently, the specification is supported by a lot of um, major modern hardware and um, major browsers. And if you're thinking of implementing pass keys for your app, it's best practice not to try to do it from scratch because there are a lot of gaps in the specification currently which a couple of libraries try to patch up and fill out. And so these are uh, um, recommendations for web apps. You have the simple web button library. If you're building for Android, there's the credential manager. And if you're building with Apple, there are um, a couple of API that Apple makes available for that. Um, for any other person who does authentication with dev tools, you can still use um, Otto or Okta or Kobado or the scope. And these ones are my favorite. Okay, I'm going to jump a lot of things. Um, but if you want to dive deeper into pass keys and um, community resources for them, this um, repo here has a lot of libraries um, and created resources for learning more about pass keys. And uh, not to waste much of your time, I will just stop here. Yeah, thank you. And sorry for.